All right. Good morning. A pleasant good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. Good to see everybody this morning. I know we've got some stuff bearing down on us, but we're going to set that aside for a moment to spend some time with our Lord and Savior. Amen. If you can, we want to invite you to continue to uh, welcome your brothers and sisters. Reach out across the aisle. Give somebody a hug. Shake someone's hand. Look at them. Tell them it's good to see you here this morning and, uh, and support one another. We, again, we've got a lot of stuff on our minds. Still recovering from one. Now we've got another one coming at us. So love on each other. Amen. And stand on your feet. Let's sing these songs. I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed. The devil and me, we don't agree. Oh, the devil and me, we don't agree. Oh, the devil and me, we don't agree. I hate him and he hates me. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. Oh, that's not all. There's more besides. Oh, that's not all. There's more beside, oh that's not all, there's more beside, I've been to the river and been baptized, all my sins are washed away, I've been redeemed, back to the top, I've been redeemed, by the blood of the Lamb, I've been redeemed, by the blood of the Lamb. Let's give him a praise offering, church. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Let's continue to sing. Come.
Heavenly Father, we do. We come before you right now, Father, in honor and praise. We thank you for the day, Father. We thank you for your salvation. As we continue to, to serve and, and worship you this morning, Father God, we just ask that you would bless and anoint this time. Let someone have a, a relationship that grows further, maybe a drawing near. Uh, maybe it's been cold for a while, Father God. Let them hear something today that plants a seed and you bring the increase in their life, Father. We praise you for it. We ask that you bless this entire day in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. You could be seated. Thank you. It's good to see everybody. Uh, we do have a few missing, no doubt, uh, in preparations of the storm. Some have made uh, a decision to uh, preemptively get out, and that's, and that's entirely uh, probably good thinking, to be honest with you. I've been down this last week with Kimberly helping her dad, and the devastation down there is real. I know we can get a real disconnect going on. I know a lot of us have lived here in Florida for a long time, and we've dodged a few. And the law of averages, I believe, has finally caught up with us. And I'm not saying that to scare you, only to prepare you. Um, just if they say get out, then get out. And don't, things can be replaced. Continue to pray for God's protection and all those things. But I would, I would be amiss by not encouraging you to do the right thing, okay? Having said that, first-time visitors, anybody here this morning, first-time visitor at our church, we don't want to embarrass you, we just want to make you feel welcome. We do have some of the back, Sister Barbara's back, good to see you, we love you, glad to be, glad you're back with us. A few have come back, I'm going to miss somebody, I'm sure, but it's good to have you with us, and uh, it's always good to welcome new visitors. If you haven't filled out a card already, and you've been here maybe a time or two, we have cards in our welcome packet. Fill one of those out if you have a prayer request. We'd like to get to know you. We want to follow up more. We want to live out the scripture in the way of the New, New Testament church looking after one another. Um, we need a few more volunteers to help us in the nursery. If you're interested in helping with the babies, please see Shelly go forth. She's actually with us this morning. Raise your hand, Sister Shelly. Again, if you'd like to help out, if you feel your heartstrings tugging, you've got uh, a ministry for the little kids, please see Sister Shelly. Again, we could use the help. Don't forget to pick up your mana bags to hand out. Again, these are the bags of the non-perishable items that we, that Sister Donna kind of encouraged us to continue on in her absence. We hope to see her soon back down with us. But if you get a chance, throw a couple of these in your back seat. They're non-perishable items. And if you see somebody in need, what a wonderful way to show God's love to reach that out the window and bless them with it. <clears throat> We're looking for a few volunteers for the Jesus birthday walkthrough. Uh, we'd like to have 15 biblical characters for the walkthrough part. We also are in need of seven to eight guides and four to five people to help serve lunch. If you're interested, there is a sign-up sheet on the back table, and we will have a meeting in December to go over everything as well. 15 biblical characters, seven to eight guides, four to five people, not a problem. The Lord will provide. Amen? It's going to be exciting. I didn't get a chance to go last year. I'm hoping to see it this year. Movie night has been rescheduled to October 18th. October 18th, movie night. Um, Faith Under Fire is the movie. Uh, October 18th, providing we're not rebuilding anything. Um, we're not claiming that. 6.30 p.m., praying we will be here and be able to make on this happen. Okay? We're selling keychains. I have them with me here this morning. Uh, I think this is a, a great effort. I've been out of the office most of the week. I've asked Pastor Brian to speak and preach to you this morning. Again, helping down in Longboat Key, my father-in-law's house, and different things that's happened at our home as well. Um, and collectively in the office, they've made a decision to sell these keychains for $5, and they're going to be in the back in the afternoon uh, after church. All the proceeds are going to go to Samaritan's Purse for the hurricane relief teams. We also, have, we also have a fundraising page on our Facebook. You can also give in the offering. If giving this way, please put on the memo of your check, Hurricane Relief, or tithe envelope, whatever, just write on it that that's where you want the money to go. And again, thank you for the support. Now, what's cool about these keychains is if you've hooked this to your keys on the back of it, it's got a QR code. You can simply tell whoever you're, you're, you're ministering to or uh, discipling or witnessing to, you can point their camera right at that if they don't have a home church, say, the conversation goes to. You don't go to church? You should check out my church. Yeah, but I don't have anything to write out. No problem. Point your camera right at one of those, and it'll take them right to our web page. Oh, wow. It'll also take them to our Facebook page. And on there, they can see past services and learn how to go live and start attending regularly in person. So, again, all the proceeds are going to Samaritan's Purse. Just something that we can in encourage others that have been affected by the storm. Amen? Amen. On sale today after church. Yeah. 
Um, fall picnic is November 2nd. Please bring a covered dish to share. The church is going to supply the meat and the drinks. A combination of pulled pork, chickens, maybe some pork belly. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful time. We're planning some music like we used to do at the old style. You know, we're going to have a moon bounce hayride. And I'd like to go out. Uh, we've been talking also. We want to open this moment up to have like a farmer's market kind of angle to this. So if you're a crafter or if you're a baker, we want you to be able to come out and set that stuff up. And if you'd like to sell it for a few bucks, put fuel in your tank or uh, put some groceries on your table, a little something to do extra. We're going to do that part of it too, okay? So bring all those goodies that you know how to break, all those little trinkets that you know how to make, and, uh, and bring them and share them with us, wouldn't you? That'd be awesome, right? And the, Oh, yeah. We're also looking for some old cars, and I don't want to make this a bunch of announcements, but we're looking for old cars. If you have like a classic automobile, we might have a few of those on display also. So if you have any of that kind of information, get back to me, uh, and I would love to talk with you more about it. Again, that's the 2nd of November, Old Time Fall Picnic, uh, God's Harvest Festival. Make plans to be there. 11 to 4, I believe it is, correct? Yeah, I think we said 11 to 2, but I think it's 11 to 4. Let's move on. Uh, Norm's Celebration of Life will be uh, November 9th at 11 a.m. Brother Norm Thurston has passed away, Sister Sheila's husband. Sister Sheila, we love you. It's good to see you here with us this morning. Um, this is your family, and uh, you guys have always been stoic in the times that we've got a chance to come over and visit with you, and she's not afraid to talk about things. This is a woman that's got her feet planted on the rock, and uh, she's been a pillar during all of this, so encourage her and, and love on them. Again, Norm's service will be the 9th of November at 11. There will be a lunch afterwards. There's a sign-up sheet on the back table. If you're able to bring a dish, uh, Sheila said plan on about 100 people to attend. Um, Norm was loved and blessed a lot of people, a gentle soul and a wonderful man of God. Even through all he went through, he still offered up sacrifices of praise, you know. So uh, let's be there for it. Also, I want to go ahead and say Wednesday night service will probably not happen this week. Um, and I will get with Pastor Brian, and I don't know if, if we have the ability to do so, maybe put something out on live again. But again, we will not have service here Wednesday just for the, the storm that is coming in, okay? I think that's all the announcements. Nope, 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 nope. Singles ministry, Saturday. We're going to meet here at 10. We're leaving at 10.15-ish for Solomon's Castle out east. Please sign up in the back of the church or call Roxy, uh, and we'll have her phone number back there. Um, you just see me. I forgot a truth. Okay. <laughs> see Miss Roxy, Singles Ministry. Yes, Miss Cindy. Yeah, if, you, uh, if you've brought back um, the shoe boxes for the children, please iron all that out with Miss Cindy before, uh, before you leave here today. All right, I believe that's all the announcements we have. Um, one more. Emmaus, this Thursday, 6 o'clock or 6.30, Brother Jay? 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall. This Thursday, Emmaus, for all of you, uh, this is fourth day stuff. For those of you that have attended Emmaus, Weekend, um, this is a reunion meeting that we do monthly. Thursday at 6 p.m. Now, that's all the, 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 the announcements I have, I believe, right? Uh-oh. All right, let's call the ushers, and we'll take up our offering. Once again, uh, before they come up, actually, hold up, gentlemen. I want to invite Adam up. A lot of this stuff is coming up fast. We've had a lot of storms. I appreciate your patience. Adam's going to speak to you for a few minutes about Kairos ministry. This is a prison ministry that we actively... Uh, encourage and support him and so brother adam give us your best quick minutes man and i'll try and speak loudly here i'll try and speak loudly here um first of all i want to start with two praise reports i didn't do the kairos last time because my dad and i attended the emmaus weekend together that was awesome and um i want to thank you for allowing us to go to that and then um so I want to start out with two more praise reports. First of all, Dad's surgery, for those of you praying for him, was a great success. He had, uh, I think it's pronounced carotid. Thank you, carotid. Uh, artery cleared. 
and now he's thinking better, speaking better, doing better, just fantastic. So I was, uh, praise God, yes, amen. So I was um, taking care of him up there, and then the hurricane came, right? And all of a sudden, nine, nine trees went down, one of them through my parents' bedroom. Four of the limbs went through the bedroom ceiling. One of them just missed dad in bed. He was there recuperating from his surgery. So I just spent all the last week chainsawing nine different trees. And four of them were on the um, power line. Please pray for my parents. They still do not have power. And um, OK, back to Kairos. Uh, so everybody can donate either through money, cash or check, or else through snacks, salt, salty ones or sweet ones, or else, if you can't do that, just through your prayers. Please uplift us in prayers. It's a powerful ministry, and, and, and I just love being involved in it. I attended my first Kairos as an inmate in 1998, 1998 at Charlotte Correctional Institution, which is the second most dangerous prison in Florida, one of the top 10 most dangerous prisons in, in the country. And God saved me and blessed me through all that. And I get to go back and minister as part of Cairo's prison ministry now. So it's between October 24th and 27th. So I only get two more Sundays to collect donations. So I'm very grateful that the church supports my, the ministry. And we need, people need to see that July 8th made 30 years of God blessed sobriety for me. They need to see living proof that 30 years of sobriety is possible. And I get to be able to be that living, breathing proof. Thanks to you. God bless you, and thank you for your support. Sorry about that, gentlemen. If our ushers would go ahead and come forward again, um, we, are, we are looking, you know, that cone of probability talk that they have. So we're going to be getting prepared this week. Uh, we'll be praying for everybody. If, if you have a need and we can physically help you, myself, got a lot of things going on, but I, I, would, I would still tell you that because I love you and care you enough that if something falls on your house, I'll try to get there with a the chainsaw. Don't hesitate. Amen. All right, let's pray over this offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you just grateful for all that you do for us. Father, we're, we're, we're hoping and praying, Father God, and standing on your promises of protection as we look at this storm. Father, for those that are gathered here today, those that are watching and on live, we pray that you bless and anoint them, Father, whatever their prayer requests might be, whatever's on their heart, Father, we just pray that you minister to them. As we take up this offering, we, we hope to do so in a way that's honorable and pleasing to you, Father, and that you would bless it, that you would multiply it for the furthering of your kingdom. Again, we thank you for the day. We ask that you would bless and anoint every aspect of this service. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. <coughs> It is finished. King of kings, Lord of lords, Jesus is Lord of all.
seated. Thank you for singing that one with us. We're going to sing a, a, a hymn. Can I pray for just a moment? Yes. <sighs> Heavenly Father, I want to come to you. I know I've already prayed. I just feel like I get serious for a minute. I feel like there's a spirit. I can look out over this congregation and I know we've talked about a lot of things and upcoming things and things that are on the way. I can look out over this congregation and I can sense a spirit of concern and worry. I can see it on their faces, Father God. I feel like it's hindering their worship, but I just pray right now that you would lift it. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I, take, I, I bind up any thought of anybody over the sound of my voice right now in the name of Jesus that's interfering with their chance to worship and commune with our Heavenly Father. I bind it in your precious Son's name, Father. I bind it right now. Father God, I pray that you continue to be with us as we praise and worship. Take control of this service. Lead the way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> Keep on the firing line. If you're in the battle for the that we all must face if we die of fighting it is no disgrace coward in the service he will find no place so keep on the firing line come on let's sing well you must fight be brave Win, forgot on the ride. 
Well, if you would win for God in the right, just keep on the firing line. Hallelujah. Let's give him a praise offering, church. We're back on track. Thank you, thank you. You can be seated. Pastor Arlen's going to come and bless you with one. Yes, Miss Peggy, I'm sorry. Praise God. <laughs> You're welcome, Sister Peggy. Praise God. <clears throat> Miss Diana, did you have something? No, you're good? Okay. That's just the devil. Amen. We're going to sing a song for you today, a song that I have a whole different perspective about. I've sung it for many years. The title of it is I'm Still Holding On, and it always kind of seemed like Almost braggadocious, you know, like, I'm still holding on. I'm tough. I'm really somebody. But the truth is, God's been the one holding. You know, he's the one holding me. There's times I've slipped a little bit. I've let go, and, but God's been right there. So really, he's still holding on. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So we'd like to do this song for you. I hope it blesses you. People said I'd never make it. I'd never see it through I don't know what keeps me going I guess I never have met you No, my life was a shambles Till the day you came along Tears and laughter. You gave me a brand new song, and I'm still holding on. Lord, I'll never let you go. You gave me a smile. You touched my heart. You touched my soul. And the bridges that's behind me, Lord, I burn into the ground. I'm still holding on. You're the best thing ever found. Oh, voted likely not to prosper. Left hanging over my head. He'll never count for nothing That's what most people say And I've been known to be unsettled I've never stayed around too long You're the treasure I was searching I'm still holding on, Lord, I'll never let you go, cause you gave me a smile, you touched my heart, you touched my soul, and the bridges that's behind me, Lord. And the bridges that's behind me, Jesus, I burned into the ground. I'm still holding on. You're the best thing you've ever found. I'm still holding on. You're the best friend I've ever found. 
And we're going to take up Holy Communion. Uh, I did hear a little bit about this is a, a very special Sunday. We're, we're going to do it this way because when you read the Bible and you learn that after they uh, committed to dinner with one another, they had Holy Communion at the end. They sang hymn afterwards. They got up and they sang after they had the supper. So we're going to try to do that this way. We're going to, we're going to have Holy Communion and then we'll finish it up with our praise and worship songs. <laughs> Uh, I think it would be the perfect thing to do, and the kids can stay for communion, and once the communion's gone, if they want to be dismissed, they can go next door with their teachers, but um, at this time, we'll go ahead and uh, remind you as we get ready and make our way to the table. For those of you that have watched us do this communion before, we again, Pastor Brian and I have come down here. We invite you to come up and grab the elements. We'll take them corporately. As a church body, uh, hold on to the elements, and then once you return to your seats, we'll pray over them, and then we can take them as a church family. Again, we don't do this this way other than it's for as at this day and age that we live in, it seems to be the, the best way and the cleanest way, healthiest way to be able to uh, distribute the communion elements. Um, I want to remind everybody, I'm going to read uh, some scripture. The, the devil's been battling with me. You know, I... A lot of things on my mind, a lot of things on everybody's mind. And when you get up here and you start preaching, you start talking about things of God, the devil will come at you and start throwing things at you. I apologize for being, I've rebuked him in the name of Jesus, but I want to get into the word because that's what we need to also, we were talking about this in Bible study Tuesday about guarding ourselves up by having that full armor of God on. If we get up and put that on, we can, we can wield away those fiery darts that come after us. So we got to remember to do that. I want to read some scripture. But we got to be prepared with the truth. We have to have the truth in us so that when those moments of worry and concern come at us, we can go just like Jesus did, back at the devil, back at the temptation, back at the trials that we're facing. I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians, and this is Paul speaking. Uh, we know the, the environment. He was there to correct them. They had been doing things wrong. People were getting together, and this big meal was happening. Some people were being left out. They weren't able to get to some of these elements. So he's instructing them. He's received from the Lord, and this is what he tells the, the church at Corinth. He says, for I have received from the Lord that which I have also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup, and after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim it, the Lord's death, until he comes. And then he goes on to warn them. He says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. He's telling them to examine themselves. In verse 26, he says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks it in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. I'm going to set the microphone down at this time. At this, I, I, would, I would encourage you in this moment as we get ready to distribute the elements that you make it a time of meditation. And make it a time that if there's anything this week, anything this morning that you woke up with that you might have on your heart, something that you felt has put distance between you and the Lord. Maybe you acted out. Maybe, maybe something, you got a bad phone call and things are weighing on your heart. Maybe your response wasn't the way that it was supposed to be. It's those things I'm talking about. Anything that you might have like that going on in your life. As we distribute these elements, take the moment to examine that. Ask for forgiveness. Tell the Lord to, to, to create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord. Renew in me the right spirit. That way we approach this communion table in a way that's righteous as best we can. Amen. So at this time, we want to invite you up. I'll ask Kimberly up. Sister Diana, is she helping you? Or you? We're going to go ahead and uh, hash get a line up, and we will pass out the elements. Once you get back to your seats, then I'll pray over each element individually, and we'll take it. Does everybody understand? Okay, if you want to go ahead and line up.
We just read the scripture, and as it said on the night that Jesus was betrayed, after dinner, he took a, bread of, a loaf of bread, and he broke it with him. And he says, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat. Dear Heavenly Father, as we get ready to take as a church family, we ask that you would bless this, this symbol of your body that was broken and bruised for us, Father God. A moment on Calvary that, that saved us for a one-way direction to hell, Father. We just thank you for that, Father. We ask that you would bless it now for the nourishment of our body. You are the true bread of life. We ask it now in your precious Son's name. Amen. Let's take the bread. On that same night, he picked up a cup. It was a very special cup. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. He went to the cross. He became sin for us, church, so that we would have uh, eternity with him. At this time, Father, we, we get ready to take what represents your blood poured out for our sins, Father. We know that you didn't, you lived a perfect life, Father. You didn't have to do it. You could have called in a, a brigade of angels that could have protected you, Father, and you didn't. You went to the cross for those that would reject you, those that would deny you. Not this morning, Father God. As, as we celebrate this communion, we do so with others around the world that are celebrating. We do so in unity, Father. One love. We just thank you for the day. We ask that you would bless this holy communion. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. amen. Let's partake. Praise God. If you would, hang on to those cups. Our deacons will be making their way around with the bags. If you'll place those in those baskets, not in your church seat backs, please. We're going to praise and worship the Lord at this time as they start collecting those, and you can do so. Stand up, and we will finish our praise and worship portion of the service. That's what they did after they celebrated this supper. They rose up and they sang hymns, and we're going to do that right now. I'm sorry. Also, at this time, if the kids want to be dismissed to Sunday school, they can leave and go next door. Well, I don't know what you came to do. I don't know what you came to do. I don't know what you came to do. I came to praise my Lord. Well, I don't know what you came to do. I don't know what you came to do. I don't know what you came to do. I came to praise my Lord. Well, I came to lift him up. I came to praise his name. I came to leave for joy. I came to clap my hands. Sing that part again. Well, I came to lift him up. I came to praise his name. I came to leap for joy. I came to clap my head. Come on, let's praise his name. Come on, let's praise that wonderful name. Ah, Jesus. Come on, let's praise that wonderful name. Ah, Jesus. Come on, let's praise that you came to do I don't know what you came to do I don't know what you came to do I came to praise my Lord come on let's praise him well I don't know what you came to do I don't know what you came to do I don't know what you came to do I came to praise my Lord come on come on let's praise that wonderful name ah Praise that wonderful name of Jesus. No other name I know. You know there's power. 
I don't know what you came to do. I came to praise my Lord. But let's do that. Come on, let's praise that wonderful name. Ah, Jesus. Come on, let's praise that wonderful name. Ah, Jesus. Come on, let's praise that While traveling through this world of sorrow, I'm on my way to glory land. I'll not turn back for some tomorrow. My trials here, I'll understand. I want to know more about my Jesus. I want to know I want to know more about that mansion I'm going to receive as my reward. I want to know more about that homeland. I mean to go there someday, somehow. And after I leave the heavenly state, I need to know more than I know. He set me free Though rough the road I shall not wait For some glad day His face I'll see I want to know more About my Jesus I want to know more About my Lord I want to know more About that mansion as my reward, I want to know more about that homeland. I mean to go there someday, somehow. And after I reach that heavenly city, I mean to know more than I know. And after I reach, and after I reach that heavenly city. We're going to slow it way down, and we're going to sing a worship song. And um, while we were taking communion, I asked you to examine yourself. Uh, I want to go back to that moment. I want to go back to that moment where you're communing with the Lord. When we sing this song, a lot of us, again, in the, in the regards to the things that are happening with the weather, that, that it's bearing down on us and stuff like that, we were talking about this before, sacrifices of praise and joy. No matter what we go through, we continue to offer up sacrifices of praise and joy and worship because of the Lord that we serve, not what we're going through. Amen? So let's continue to worship him this last song. Majesty, worship his majesty unto Jesus. Let's start again. It's just the devil, I'm telling you. Get out of here, devil, in the name of Jesus. Get out of here. Majesty. Worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory. From his throne unto his own, his anthem. I want to sing that first part again, church. Sing it from your heart. Majesty, worship his majesty unto Jesus. His 
Jesus anthem rings. So it's exalting, church. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Father, again, we want to come to you and ask that you would bless and anoint every part of this service. Again, Father, if there's a spirit of anybody that's concerned, anxious about anything, Father, I pray that you give them the peace and the rest in their minds and in their hearts to know and fully trust in you and focus on you. Father God, I pray that you speak through Pastor Brian. I pray that the Holy Spirit come forth in a bold way through this man, Father, and that he would speak over us a word that you intended for us to hear. Prepare their hearts, Father. I rebuke any evil spirits in this room, any, any kind of spirit that's come over us to try to keep us from worshiping in the way that you would have us do so, Father. Continue to have your way here. This service is for you. We glorify you, our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 You could be seated. Got a message. Glory to God, hallelujah, Lord. Uh, young, a young Christian, all four kids at home, <coughs> living in a house that was best described as improvised. And anyway, we heard you don't you don't get hurricanes where we were living. You you just won't get them. And I'm standing out in the back of the the car of the house rather. I had already prayed for the day, Lord, to protect our home, our family, our goods. And I'm in the back next to the next door neighbor. Uh, he has a tall, like a, I don't know, it was at least 12 foot tall, to, so you could pull a big rig in <coughs> right next to the end of my house. Standing there looking at it, listening to the wind, and all of a sudden I heard it sound like a train coming from a distance. And I thought this would be a good time to repeat my prayers that you keep. Uh, preserve family home and goods. So I noticed this garage next door starting to moving around a little bit and the noise is coming closer. And the starts, the, the garage starts, stops moving around and starts lifting straight up with the concrete foundry still attached to the uh, the, the columns, I guess you call them. Anyway, big clots, big clots of, hallelujah, Lord, concrete. And as it was tugging, it was pulling it up and down, the foundation coming with the, the things. Finally, it got to be quite strong sound, and the wind was coming and all of a sudden, the whole garage picked up <coughs> and started tumbling end over end. 
on his next building behind his garage. Well, everything started flying at that point, and when it passed, there was his entire garage had been disassembled to individual pieces, and it was placed in a in a in a neat stack between where his garage had been and the end of my house started, maybe 15 or 20 feet, the whole thing laying there. And the only damage I got was a little place like this, a piece flying out had made a little scar on the side of the paint on my little house. So Jesus, today, here and now, Oh, dear God, we pray for your protection for our families, our homes, and our goods. Lord, wonder you just what to say except we put it in your hands, and thank you, Lord, that you hear us. Lord, give you the praise and the honor that you will indeed do these things for us all. In Jesus' name, amen. So good morning. Oh, we can do better. Good morning. There we go. That's better. You know, it, it, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to be here this morning um, to, to deliver God's message to you all this morning. Um, I had mentioned to Rick a, a while back, said, hey, you know, um, any Sunday you need me to preach, just let me know. Well, on, I told him this on, on Monday, and and all that happened and everything else, he's like, hey, um, he gives me a call later on Monday afternoon and said, yeah, can you preach on Sunday? I said, absolutely. So my message today is called being prepared or be prepared. I wasn't prepared to deliver the message this morning, but God said, hey, I've got something for you to do, something for you to say, something for you to teach, something for you to give the word on for, to everybody and anybody that shows up and is able to hear, hear my voice which is God's voice. So if you would, please pray with me. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning, for this opportunity to be able to deliver this message this morning, dear Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to send your Holy Spirit to me. Let me be on fire for you and be able to love on you and let the words that come out of my mouth be your words, dear Heavenly Father. And let this just be an awesome service, an awesome message, and, and your words just be able to get to all these people that are here this morning. For we do thank you and we praise you for it all. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to the book of John, chapter 6, and I'll be referencing between uh, verses 1 through 15, and I'll be reading through the NIV version this morning. But we'll get to those here in a moment. And this story is, if you, if you look up in your Bible, you go, oh, that's feeding of the 5,000. Jesus feeds the 5,000. You know, this story is prominent in part because it's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, this is the only event, I want you to hear that, this is the only event outside of the crucifixion that all four of the Gospels record. Did you hear me? Between this and the crucifixion, it's only two stories that both all four of those Gospels record. Must be pretty important, right? Must be one of those stories you go, oh, wow, maybe I need to dive a little bit farther into it. And because it's a fact that it's recorded in all the Gospels, along with the fact that it's a great feel-good story, right, um, about the Lord providing for the physical needs of a crowd. But have you ever stopped simply to ask, what's the point? Think about that. What's the point? Is Jesus simply a charity worker that wants to fill people's bellies, or is there really more to that story? We're actually told an important detail in the passage. This wasn't a charity pro project. Rather, it was a test. And specifically, Jesus was testing his disciples. Where were they turned in the midst of impossible circumstances, right? And it's there we see that the key component of this passage for us, we must depend on God in the midst of our difficult circumstances. But we really see two things in Jesus' feeding of the 5,000. 
First, we should expect to have our faith tested, which is verses 1 through 10. And then second, we should look to the Lord and expect Him to provide for us abundantly, which is verses 11 through 15. So let's focus on verses 1 through 10 to begin with, which is expect your faith to be tested. Who's Whose faith here is being tested today? Whose faith will be tested this week? And next week, and then next week, and every single moment, every day, right? Our faith is going to be tested. But in this passage, there's a subtle lie that I think most of us believe that if we do things just right, we'll have an easy life. Sound right? We can eliminate all challenges simply by doing the right thing. But we all know that that's not true. Because so many of you have an incredible challenges in your life through no fault of your own. Sometimes what someone does, else does presents a challenge in your life. Sometimes it's someone else's sin that creates difficult circumstances in your life. Every one of us has faced hardships right? We've all faced hardships because life is hard. It's challenging, isn't it? Every day, it's challenging. You know, talking about challenging on Thursday, coming to the office, you know, where 674 and 301, they kind of go from four lanes down to single lane on either side, and I go through the intersection. This lady pulls in front of me, you know, turns, and I'm like, okay, no big deal. We average 30 mile an hour down that stretch of the road. All the cars are behind me, blowing the horn, and eventually they're all like, I'm like, what am I supposed to do? I can't pass. There's too many other cars coming. So I came into the office, and I've got a buzzer on my desk, and I meant to grab it, but you've got a bill here somewhere, right? I had to come in and hit my buzzer because I needed that moment to release. Jamie could tell, I testified, I came in and hit my buzzer. We all have those stressful moments in our lives, don't we? And it's challenging. And the Lord will use those circumstances to test each and every one of us. That's a well-documented biblical fact. We don't know when, how, or even if we're being tested. But nevertheless, the Lord tests each and every one of us. And obviously, it's, it's a major component of this passage. So our passage this morning opens in the middle of Jesus' Galilean ministry. There's likely been a large passage of time between Jesus healing the lame man at the pool of Bethesda and him feeding of the 5,000. What seems to be assumed by the Apostle John is the reader's familiarity of the signs and wonders that he performed to Galilee. In fact, the other gospel writers record in much detail Jesus' Galilean ministry. And it's important that we understand this detail because it helps us understand the origin of the crowd. But obviously, these people knew of the miraculous signs and wonders that Jesus had performed, right? Why else would they be following him around if they didn't know of all these different things? So this explains why John tells us. So we're going to look at verse 2, John chapter 6, verse 2. It says, And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. I don't know about you, but see somebody performing all these miraculous signs, and I've got an ailment, I'm going to follow, right? Like, me next, right here, can I, can I go next, right? Absolutely. And so what's quite clear is that the crowd is only interested in what he can physically do for them. They're following him out of selfish moves. They're not looking for a savior from sin. They're looking for a man to cure this rash, this, this broken arm, this illness, grandma's bunion, right? Whatever it might be, right? He's looking to, for them to, him to cure whatever it might be. But Jesus understood all of this. He understood it all. He was aware of what was going on. He knew that they were following him for the wrong reasons. But I'm going to ask you this. What does he do? He sits down and he waits for him. 
Wow. Now if I can get back up. <laughs> he sits down and waits for him. He knew that they were looking for the wrong motive, but he didn't care. Because he has a different motive, a different plan, a different thing that he wants to do. So he sits there for them. You know, we don't even like it when an unfamiliar car pulls into our own driveway, do we? Have you ever had an unfamiliar car pull into your driveway? And you run through the house and you're turning off all the lights, shutting the blinds, and you be real quiet. Make sure they didn't see you, right? (laughs) Probably was more so when the door-to-door salesmen were, right? But none of us enjoy answering the door and there's a window person. Hey, we're in your neighborhood and our neighbor next door is having windows installed and we thought we'd... We all try to avoid that moment, don't we? We all try to avoid being that person that, oh, I got you, right? Often we try to avoid people that just want something from us. But our Lord didn't do that. This crowd followed him for all the wrong reasons. And rather than running away from them and hiding, he sits down and waits for them. His kindness, his compassion, his full display, but really this whole thing is set up to test his disciples. We're also told in verse 4 that the Jewish Passover feast was near. The Jewish Passover feast was near, which is significant because the Passover was a day of great nationalistic zeal. Basically, the Passover was like 4th of July. Who here likes 4th of July? Anybody? Be able to celebrate our nation's freedom and all those things and watch fireworks from afar. And um, There's so many stories I have about fireworks going bad that I stay afar. (laughs) But so no doubt, no doubt how the Lord had miraculously freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt would be on their minds. And Jesus would have certainly been aware of this as well, right? It's a great reminder how the Lord spared the people from death through the blood of a lamb that had to be smeared on their doorposts, which points to Christ's sacrificial death on that cross. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But everything in this passage is setting up verse 5, which says, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to the Philip, where shall we buy bread to test these pe- uh, for these people to eat? Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? It wasn't a Walmart, a Publix, or anything really close, was there? Right? Obviously, this, doesn't, this, this feeding of the 5,000 doesn't include the women or the children. Some scholars speculate this could mean there were somewhere around 20,000 people in the crowd. If you were to ask to find bread and, and a meal for 20,000 people, could you do it? On a split moment? A crowd of 20,000 people is approaching, and Jesus looks at Philip and says, where are we going to buy bread so these people may eat? Can you imagine the look on Philip's face? <laughs> what? You want me to find bread? Where are we going to buy this bread? But verse 6 kind of helps us round out our understanding of this. He's asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind to do what he knew what he was going to do. He already knew what he was going to do, right? But he was doing this to test, to test the disciples. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen? He wasn't asking Philip because he was generally needed help. He asked Philip in order to see what he would say. Jesus knew he would provide for the crowd, but the disciples, they didn't. You can almost hear the panic in Philip's voice. Um, um, 200 denarii um, worth of, of bread would not be enough for each of them to even get a little bit. In other words, Philip's response was that nearly a year's salary wouldn't be enough for everyone to have a crumb because a denarii was a day's wage. 
a year's salary would not be enough for everybody to even have a crumb. And you don't want 20,000 people to go hungry, do you? You might have a, 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 a revolt right on your hands, right? And that's when Andrew speaks up. Well, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. I really feel sorry for this boy. He lost his lunch, right? <laughs> you can really hear his doubt and skepticism when he says, well, how far will they go among so many? Right? But do you see the problem with this whole situation? How did they respond to Jesus' testing? I like the way one commentator described Philip and Andrew's response. They all calculated, but failed to exercise faith. They all figured it out, but they failed to exercise faith. This is precisely what the disciples did, isn't it? They immediately jumped into the problem-solving mode. They were trying to take matters into their own hands. They were looking to themselves. They were trusting in their own strength. So Philip's self-reliance is all of our natural inclination. We typically ask ourselves, what am I going to do? Instead of asking God, what are you going to do? I need your help. The Christian perspective should be less self-reliant and more God-dependent. should be less self-reliant and more God-dependent. But our self-reliance is exactly what Jesus is challenging. So I'm asking you this, why are we so self-reliant? And one of the glaring, glaring ironies of this passage is that Jesus feeds the 5,000 in the middle of his Galilean ministry. His Galilean ministry was full of miraculous signs and wonders. The disciples would have seen, heard, experienced the miraculous signs and wonders so Philip shouldn't have defaulted to the self-reliance when Jesus asked him where they should go and buy bread. Instead, he should have said, Lord, we can't feed these people, but you can. Because that's the point, isn't it? This is mission impossible. There's no way for them in their own strength, using their own resources in such a short period of time to feed something like 20,000 people. And this is precisely what Jesus wanted Philip, Andrew, and all the disciples to see. They needed him. And in order for these people to get fed, Jesus was going to have to do something. You know, it's easy to go on your day-to-day -day life and not once think about God. You ever thought about that? And it's so easy to jump straight into crisis management mode the moment something doesn't go right. And this is all in spite of the fact that we all sense our own weaknesses, frailty, and sin on a daily basis. We forget about the Lord, or worse, we live like He isn't even there. We all know that each and every day presents an opportunity for the challenging, for those circumstances. How many times have our lives taken a wild left turn on days that were supposed to be boring and normal? I want you to think about last week when that hurricane came through and this week when possibly another one's coming through. Our lives are boring and normal except for when the storms come through, right? then all of a sudden things go into chaos and, and, and craziness, right? The question is never, we will face difficult circumstances. The question is always, how will we respond to different circumstances? Will you look for guidance and help from the Lord? Or will you try to fix your circumstances like God doesn't even exist you know, it's easy to live like the Lord doesn't exist when you believe that you've earned everything that you have. Let's say that again. It's easy to live like the Lord doesn't exist when you believe that you've earned everything that you have. We tend to forget that everything we have is a glorious gift from our Lord. 
Every good and perfect gift comes from above. It's simply a fundamental truth that we all must believe as Christians. So all of a sudden in our passage, in verse, starting at verse 11, this passage kind of makes a turn. The Lord provides abundantly. So let's look at verses 11 through 15 of the John chapter 6. It goes on to say, Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had all got enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. And after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is coming into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So it's no surprise that once Jesus had five loaves and two fish, which is, by the way, a poor person's meal, he gives thanks to God for it. He deliberately stops to acknowledge the Lord's provision, which ironically was extremely insufficient. It's impossible for five loaves and two fish to feed 20,000 people, right? Even if everybody take a crumb, that's still not enough. But obviously we know what miracle happens, don't we? The five loaves and those two fish miraculously multiply. Miraculously it becomes more. We don't know the exact mechanics of the miracle. We don't know exactly how the boy's small meal multiply. But does it really matter? The clear point is that there, there was enough for everybody to eat their fill. I don't know about you, but I could eat two fish and five pieces of bread myself. As long as it's cooked right. For certain fish, not well, anyways. But there was plenty of food for everybody. In fact, there was more left over after feeding everyone than there was at the beginning. They took up 12 basketfuls worth of food. I think there's a little nod there to how the Lord took care of and provided for the 12 tribes, right? All of the people of Israel by having 12 basketfuls left over. You know, that sort of thing happens to us, but it's not the way the Lord works, is it? He's never barely getting by. He has never just enough to get the job done. There's never been a situation where the Lord is in the back of the room holding his breath saying, I really hope that this works out. When the Lord provides, he provides what? Abundantly. We say that together, he provides abundantly. He always exceeds our needs. And isn't that true for all of us spiritually? There's always sufficient and abundant grace to cover our sin. You probably already picked up on this from our passage, but the important takeaway is just that, that, that the Lord provided abundantly. But isn't that all of our experiences? Just look around here. I'm pretty sure most of us all rode in a car to get here. Most of us have a roof over our heads. We eat three meals a day, right? Wouldn't you agree that your needs have been simply been met? That the Lord has provided abundantly for each and every one of you? I think we probably all agree that we all have plenty of stuff. What's really interesting is that I've heard stories of people living in the, in the backwoods of, of Africa. They're walking for miles to get water and being exceedingly happy. In fact, if they were here with us, they'd be nodding along, said, yes, the Lord has provided abundantly for me too to walk miles to be able to just even get water. Obviously, the amount of stuff you have isn't what makes you content. What do you think? Oh, I'm sorry. Who do you think gave you all that stuff? How do you believe your needs are being met today? 
Is it all you and your creativity and intelligence that got you where you're at? Or did the Lord give you your creativity and intelligence to get you where you are at? One view is entirely man-centered, while the other is God-centered. And there is an eternal difference between the two. Jesus' own disciples missed the point that they needed to look to him to provide. The crowd, likewise, missed this point also, right? Because they were just looking for what? Food and to be healed. And the crowd saw in this miracle was their physical needs were being met, which is precisely what they were looking for in a Messiah. They wanted a king that would meet their physical needs by giving them food to eat like Moses did with the manna in the wilderness. And Moses led the people out of slavery to the Egyptians, and they wanted to be freed from the bondage to the Roman Empire. And all this would have certainly been on their mind around Passover, which commemorates their freedom from slavery to the Egyptians and how the people of Israel were provided manna to eat. The, the crowd even said that Jesus was the prophet who has come into the world which was a reference to Moses' messianic prophecy in Deuteronomy 18, verse um, 15. And I'm going to read that for you this morning. No, I'm not. Sorry. I just did. That's my note. <laughs> the crowd even said to Jesus, the prophet who has come into the world, the prophet has come into the world. And all of this helps us understand why Jesus would flee the people. His kingdom was not of this world because he came to save the people from their sins. But again, the physical always points to the spiritual. If God provides for each of us physically, then we should expect him to provide for us spiritually. Here's what I think that we need to remember, and this is just coming from me. There's sufficiency in the Lord's provision, right? Because not only does the Lord provide... We can always trust that it will be enough. In fact, what the Lord provides is always more than enough. So I want you to remember what Jesus said in the book of Matthew. So if you have your Bible and you took to Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to read verse 31 through 34. It says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after, after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Or I want you to remember what the Apostle Paul said. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to be have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content, if any, in every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. So there's a direct correlation between trusting the, the Lord will provide and your personal contentment. The more that you trust the Lord will provide, that what he has given you is enough. The more you content, you will, it, will be. So when difficult circumstances inevitably arise, you have an incredible opportunity to demonstrate and to live out your dependence on God. There'll probably be a day where the Lord will look down on you and say, where are we going to buy bread so that these people may eat? May each of us respond with, Lord, I can't do it, but you can. God loves each and every one of you. God knows what's on our plates this week. God knows what's on our hearts, our minds, and our, and our souls. 
God knows that the devil's going to try his best to get into our minds and, and all that happens. So in Jesus' name, I ask the devil just to flee, to be gone. And the Lord is with us, and he provided for all these people to be fed. The Lord provided for them a message, a testing, an understanding. So love God this week. Praise God and all that happens this week. And take the love of Jesus Christ with you in all that you do and all that you say. And love on your neighbor as Jesus would love on, on you also. So can you please stand for a moment? Jesus loves each and every one of you. Jesus is with you now, later today, tomorrow, next week, next year, whatever it might be. If you have something heavy in your mind today, I ask you to come forward and, and pray up here at the altar rail. If you have something that's hurting, that you're striving for, you don't know what to do, come forward. Maybe you need to just stay in your spot there and cry your, your eyes out. It's okay, because God loves who you are. God knows who you are. Don't try to hide from anything, because God knows every, exactly everything that you are. He counts all the hair on top of your head. Well, some of you have hair. I don't, but this is besides the point. But God loves each and every one of you. Reach out to God this morning. Fully trust in God this, this morning and this week that everything's going to be okay. So would you please bow your heads? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this morning to be able to worship your name together, be able to praise your name together. The Lord, as we are looking on this week, and things don't look so great, dear Lord, we know that we should trust and obey, for there is no other way but through Jesus, dear Lord. So this week, let us be able to glorify your name, praise your name, and all that happens, and be able to just say, thank you, Lord, for you are God, and you are mighty and powerful and wonderful in all so many things, dear Lord. So go in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, our true Lord and Savior, and the people of the church said, amen, amen.